appreciate the warm introduction. Uh, Angie, remind me to shorten those CVs. Uh, they're a little bit more than is necessary. Let's just, let's just summarize as I'm a proud uh, resident, resident of Sadiat Island, a great admirer of NYU Abu Dhabi and all the remarkable things going on here, and uh, proud uh, uh, husband to Brooke and, and father of Ava and Rowan who are in the back. So, uh, so thank you for inviting us all here today for what is indeed a very special week for us at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. This, this week is our busiest transplant week, uh, not only in the history of organization, but the history of the nation, if not the entire region. And you can't plan these things well, but we're absolutely delighted that out of the tragedy of few comes the miraculous gift of life for many. Out of the unavoidable tragedy of the loss of life comes the miraculous gift of life for many. And that's truly what's remarkable about transplantation and what's remarkable about us being able to be a part of the start of this wonderful program right here in Abu Dhabi. Um, I'd like to begin with a story. Uh, transplantation is a very human endeavor. We're all scientists, we're academics, as you all are. Uh, we're surgeons, I'm a heart surgeon, uh, and, I'm, and the chief executive officer, as you know. Uh, but this is a very human story, and I'd like to begin with just that. I'll take you back to the night of December 5th, 2017. We had just identified the first appropriate donor for the first human heart transplant in the United Arab Emirates. Really a remarkable night. Uh, as the CEO, as well as the heart surgeon, along with my team, I felt enormous responsibility. Responsibility to the patient, responsibility to the hospital and, and to, the, to the nation. Uh, and therefore, we, we planned very, very carefully. As the recipient, or as the donor was being prepared in the operating room and all of the multi-organ teams were coming together, I, I did something that I usually do before I go into heart surgery, and that is have a very human conversation with my patient. So I wandered up to the floor, and I, I found this young man, looked incredibly young. I met him for the first time that night. It's usually a team of people who prepare the patients. Uh, and I met him for the first time. And he smiled at me and invited me to come in. And I was surprised there was no one with him. I asked him if, if I could sit, sit down with him on his bed and have a conversation. He said, of course. So during these conversations, the typical course of events is we discuss the indications for the operation, why he was a good candidate, what the other alternatives would be, uh, medicines, a mechanical heart, or indeed a new heart as he was receiving. And he, he explained to me that he'd been suffering with debilitating symptoms that didn't allow him to be a dad, didn't allow him to be a husband, and didn't allow him to work. So truly a sad, sad story. And he said, I really want this transplant to get on with my life. So I finished my discussions with him, and I promised him we'd take, as, as I usually do with my patients, a very human, human conversation. We'll take very, very good care of you, just as if you were, if you were our own family. That's something that I find reassures patients. And as I was about to leave, I, I sort of pondered, again, in, in, in a role as a CEO, the impact that this transplant was going to have, not only on his family, but the community, the nation, and in global transplantation. I shared this with him. And I also shared the striking coincidence that this was going to occur on the evening of the 50th anniversary of the first human heart transplant ever to occur, performed by Christian Barnard in South Africa. He thought for a moment and smiled and he said, you know, that's very, very great news and I'm, I'm excited for the impact that this will make, but there's something even more important to me, doctor. This is the day of the birthday of my seven-year-old daughter and I just wanna hug her in the morning when I wake up. So with that, I promised him, with that renewed sense of commitment, that we would indeed save his life and return him to his daughter the next day. We went down to the operating room and the and operation proceeded immensely, uh, in, 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 in immensely expeditious and smooth way. Everything worked like clockwork. This is a team that had worked together in heart surgery but had never before performed transplantation. 
yet amongst the tens of transplantations and your hundreds of transplantations that I've had the privilege of participating in and the thousands of cardiac cases, miraculously, this was an operation where everybody on the team of teams required to make it happen performed exceedingly well. It was like we'd been working together for decades. It was a miracle that was waiting to happen, and I'm sure Dr. Sankari has a similar story about the transplants he performs in the kidney. But what I'd like to finish off by saying is after a mere 90 minutes of the heart being stopped, when we took the cross clamp off and restored blood into the heart, the heart sprung into life. Boom, 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 without even a shock necessary. The patient had his breathing tube removed the next day and delighted to report that he returned to being a dad, a husband, and a, 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 a productive member of the Abu Dhabi community. So truly a global first in transplantation that I'm humbled along with my team to have been able to participate in. But that is a fitting introduction to a very, very human story. And indeed, every story has a human element, but particularly in transplantation. But what's remarkable about transplantation and what's remarkable about the privilege that we have at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi of beginning such a, a, a monumental uh, program in the world of medicine is this all started with a vision. A vision of the Lake Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan. And indeed, he too had a transplant journey at the Cleveland Clinic. And some say it was those discussions when he was being treated at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, that led to his vision of a new era of healthcare for his people in the UAE. And it's three things that I often like to remind people of that make our program truly unique. The first is that remarkable vision shared by, by a few other countries around the globe, actually. I've been struck as my colleagues have about that vision. Number two is the need of the people. Truly, in many cases, second world medicine in a first world nation with remarkable academics and culture and infrastructure. And the third is the ability of two great global stakeholders, the Cleveland Clinic and Mubadala, to lean in and, and take a chance on each other to make something remarkable happen and to make something remarkable happen in conjunction with the National Transplant Committee headed by Dr. Ali Bailey, who's in the front row here, the regulators and the payers. So three things, the vision of the remarkable ruler, uh, the need of the people, and the ability of two great global stakeholders along with regulators to make something remarkable happen that's never before occurred in medicine. Who are we at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi? So all of you have seen the remarkable building that we're privileged to, to practice in, uh, and it rivals the, the best hospital campus on the planet. But that's not what's truly special about Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. It's a sea of dedicated people and smiling faces. When you walk in the door, you'll be greeted by 5,400 of them, supporting 364 beds, scalable to 500. And we're just set to begin building our seven floor oncology cancer tower and further expanding the cancer program. So truly a remarkable project, but our mission is simple and it's founded on 100 years of experience and commitment originating at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Treatment of the sick, investigation into their problems through academics and training those who serve. Our mission is to train the next generation of healthcare leaders, not only in Abu Dhabi, but around the globe. So this is our, our chassis, uh, and uh, we've had a series of remarkable firsts that I won't go into in, in great detail. But what I would like to remind you is that these are some of the things that I have on this slide that have never before been offered to patients in the country or in the region. And it relies on this concept that we leverage at the Cleveland Clinic called the team of teams. Every one of these procedures and accomplishments relies on an ability of people to work together in a collaborative and not a competitive way. So our first complex windpipe operation, these are procedures that would typically require an airline flight to receive treatment until just this year. Over 400,000 completed patient visits and in total over 1.5 million since we opened our doors just over three years ago, 13,000 surgeries and procedures, 7,500 admissions, 
a procedure that we just uh, alluded to the other, the other a minute ago, a cardioband transcatheter ca cardiac procedure. What's that? Very, uh, very, very um, uh, a few years ago, it, we required open heart surgery with an open chest to repair a condition that I've based my career on called mitral valve repair. I'm delighted to report that we now can not only do this robotically at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, but we can do it through a mere pinprick in the groin by utilizing a catheter that snakes up through the veins, through the other side of the heart, and into the left side of the heart while the heart is still beating to allow it to be fixed. And this, again, has never before been done in North America. It was done for one of the first times in the globe right here in Abu Dhabi. Operation Smile is a philanthropic, charitable organization that we've welcomed into our chassis for two years in a row to treat the most complex cleft lip and palates of babies, of children, and of young adults anywhere in the world. Um, uh, residency programs in line with our academic mission, we've opened three world-class training programs in internal medicine, eye, and general surgery, and we're set to launch even further residency training and fellowship programs in the years to come. And finally, we're serving the community by welcoming in a whole generation of Emirati youth who would love to know what it's like to be a caregiver and be next to these world-class uh, world and life-changing procedures such as transplantation. Our, our transplant mission uh, was aligned with our global mission at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. We promised the nation three years ago when we opened our doors that we would treat patients with complex and critical disease close to home in their communities, preventing them from having to travel abroad while training the next generation of Emirati healthcare leaders. Our transplant mission is, is dovetailing into this broader mission and relies on a specific set of, of priorities and levels of preparedness. Uh, we needed to recruit a multidisciplinary team of, of not only surgeons, but nurses, pharmacists, infectious disease specialists, people who cleaned our building and cooked our food, truly a team of teams approach in order to allow these transplant patients to survive and to thrive. Uh, the support services are listed there. The GCC Transplant Committee, headed by Dr. Ali O'Bailey, was truly a visionary committee that was the leader in plowing the way forward and preventing obstacles from coming in our way and potentiated the birth of transplantation in the UAE and in conjunction with global transplant organizations worldwide. And finally, the Department of Health uh, approval for our living related program uh, that I'll be speaking about in just a mo moment. Now, as surgeons, we always say that we always trust our patients and our operations to a safe pair of hands. And I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Bashir Sankari and his safe pair of hands. He's completed well over a thousand kidney transplants in his career. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bashir Sankari. Well, th thank you, Rakesh. It's really hard to follow you after this uh, excellent speech here. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd li I would like not to get into too much details and technical, uh, you know, uh, jargons, but this is how it all started at the Cleveland Clinic. In 1964, a team of four kidney surgeons got together and successfully completed the first living-related kidney transplant in, in Cleveland Clinic. And this really uh, highlights the teamwork effort that really the Cleveland Clinic has envisioned all for, for, for all these years. Uh, you know, so 1964 was the first kidney, and then things start growing fast. In 1987, we exported the transplant programs into national outside out, boundaries outside Ohio. We had program in three different states. In 2007, we helped. We went international and help Sheikh Khalifa Medical City start their transfer program. And now at CCAD 2017, we started the transfer program in, 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 uh, at the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Uh, last year, 2000, September 2017, we celebrated in Cleveland 3,000 kidney transplant completed for the Ohio uh, campus and 5,000 kidney transplant that happened all over the states, including Abu Dhabi. Uh, so why, 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 kidney, why, why do we do organ transplant? Uh, really, it's, it's really saving lives. 
and giving people a second chance to a better life. Uh, our population is, grow, is, incre is getting older. We are able to handle complex, complex uh, diseases and patients are surviving longer. So we're gonna see more organ failures. And these patients, despite what we do to prevent organ failures, these patients will need organ transplant. And after they receive their organ transplant, they, they, need, they need lifelong care for the rest of their lives. This is where, where, we, where, this is where we come, and this is what we, we are developing to take care of these patients. Uh, you know, when I came to the UAE in 2012, and uh, you know, Dr. Ahuda mentioned uh, they had this 2013, they had, they had a, uh, you know, in this venue actually, a New York University a venue, but we were in the old campus in the downtown area. They had an anthropologist from, uh, from, from, from Brown University, Dr. Shireen, and discussing organ donation in the Muslim world. And this was an eye opener to me. Her, her title of her book, the title of her book was our, our organs, our, our body belong to God. And essentially, it came out of a discussion of one of the Muslim spiritual leaders in the Arab world when he was on a national or pan-Arab TV receiving a phone call from a dad who wanted to donate a kidney to his son and ask him, can I donate a kidney to my son? So his answer was, how can you donate something that doesn't belong to you? So even, even to him was not allowed to do that. This was in the year 2000, but certainly 2001, his successor fully endorsed organ donation based on uh, you know, you're, you're saving lives. This is the essential for all religion. Whichever religion and domination you are, saving life is the essential part. And all religion now endorse organ, organ donation and or endorse transplant. And, and, and this is a study that was done at uh, Mohammed bin Rashid University in Dubai. And Dr. Ali, Dr. Ali Abeli is very aware of this uh, study, looking at, at, the, uh, you know, at, 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 at the perception of people in the UAE, both expats and national, about organ donation. And as you can see, more than two thirds will donate their organs. Uh, or they sign their donor card, or they will even consent to donate the organs of their loved one if they have brain dead. So really, this separates the myth from the reality. This is the reality. The myth that Muslims don't donate is wrong. Muslims do donate. If you look in the Muslim world, the, you look at the, some of the higher, high, highest organ donation rate, both living donor and, and deceased donor, is in Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, one of the highest rate of donation, and they're all Muslim countries. So there is religious and, and community acceptance for organ donation. So, so irrespective of what living donation can do, living donation is not going to be able to solve the, uh, the, the shortage of organs. We, more patients now qualify for, for organ transplantation. Living donation can be done, for example, for kidney, for liver, but some organs you cannot do living related heart, lung, small bowel, pancreas. So you need to develop a uh, disease donor program in the country to be able to satisfy the demand and improve the life and save patients' life. So this is where, uh, so, so one, one word here, that come to mind, I mean, when, when you have lack, lack of resource, lot of lack of medical resources in the country with richness, it's just a formula for disaster. Uh, you know, patient used to go abroad for commercial transplantation and they're being abused. Because, you know, reasons I say abused because they, 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 they don't go to a respected places. It's illegal to go somewhere and buy organs. So they do it in centers that are suboptimal centers. And uh, when they come back home, we've seen a lot of disaster as far as infection complication. We've seen even deaths. Uh, the international law now really does not allow commercial transplantation. The UAE fully endorsed this, and they signed the commitment not to, not to pursue this commercial, uh, uh, commercial transplantation anywhere. And the UAE is fully compliant with this. And we encourage our patients not to go this route 
there's plenty of donors in the country. On a daily basis, there is at least seven brain death patients in the country. And this is what we really need to pursue to increase uh, organ, do uh, you know, organ transplant, to pursue uh, organ donation from disease donor. So uh, the way we developed it at uh, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, uh, we waited. I mean, we did not start transplantation on day one. The hospital opened door April 2015. You could not start transplant on day one. You have to wait for the other services to be available, all the technical support of the program to be available. And uh, toward, toward, the, toward the spring of 2015, we felt we have all the infrastructure to start the program. We invited the GSCC transplant committee to come and visit us. And they look at our facility and our readiness. And they fully endorsed us to start the transplant program. Uh, and we got the green light from a leadership to proceed. So we went to the Department of Health, you know, and uh, applied uh, for the department for, for uh, to, 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 uh, to allow us to start uh, to, 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 to do the additional licensing to do organ transplantation, kidney transplantation at that time, living related. And Dr. Ali Aubedli was part of the National Transplant Committee that fully endorsed us. And we got this endorsement in December 2017. This led to the first a living related kidney transplant to be done April 2017. So, so it, it, so it needs a lot of preparation to do this, uh, the preparation uh, to get the staff ready for this. And once we completed the phase one, we have to, phase, to move to the phase two, which is the developing of the disease donor program. And the disease donor program has to await the changes in the legislation in the country and the regulations. These changes in the regu regulations came in, in, in August 2016. The president of the country signed a decree, which I call the Anatomical Gift Act, for those of us come from the United States, that President Johnston signed in 1964. This is the Anatomical Gift Act. He signed uh, the, the, the brain death law is, is, is death. So th this is really uh, s satisfy uh, the need to really allow us to recover organ from brain dead people. And also he entrusted the Ministry of Health to come up with the criteria to define brain death and legalize, allowing us to recover organs from brain dead people. The Ministry of Health came back in May 2017 with the rule that uh, the criteria for the brain death. And after that, we were able to proceed with a, a disease donor organ uh, transplantation. Uh, the first donor was in June 2017, and this was done at Cosimi Hospital. It was the first multiple organ donor. We also got help from our partners at the uh, Saudi Center of Organ Transplantation, since Saudi uh, has been very, very involved in organ donation for the last 30 years. Uh, so, uh, so, since, so since then, you know, uh, we, we, we expanded the program, not just from, from, for, for kidneys. We expanded uh, the program uh, to, uh, to, to, to extra renal organs for heart, lung, liver. Uh, and uh, I put here uh, that mentioned to you the first deceased donor transplant, the kidney transplant done at CCAD was uh, in September. But the first multiple organ was done two months before that. And uh, December 2017, as Dr. Rakesh Suri mentioned, we did our first heart transplant uh, at, at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. And uh, Rakesh, you want to take it from here, uh, finish what we have done? Thank you. Bashir, Bashir is a soft-spoken man, but one of the most talented uh, transplant surgeons on the planet and really uh, an incredibly inspiring leader, uh, not only for his group, but the entire transplant group. So I'd like to really thank Bashir and, and Dr. Ali O'Bailey for their tireless efforts to put us, put us where we are today. So let's talk a little bit about where we are. Um, uh, the first deceased donor heart I spoke about, uh, and, I'm, and I'm delighted to report that we just performed our second one last Friday. It was, a, it was a special one for a couple reasons, but let me give you another heart transplant story, as Bashir will tell you. Heart transplants always occur on birthdays, holidays, vacations, and when there's a, a lot of pressing family events. And such was the case with this, one of our probably only 
planned family vacation since, since we arrived four years ago. We're just about to leave to Italy, me to give a couple of talks and my family to join me. I, and a, a donor had arrived, but this was a remarkable donor. It's a donor that gave the gift of life to five other people. And it was clearly badly needed for many, many reasons. So as many of us did, we sent our family on their way. My family went with, without me to Italy and I stayed with Bashir and the team and Ali and worked work through the night. But let me tell you a little bit about the story of the heart, at least from my perspective. This was a heart uh, failure patient, much like the other patient, but who couldn't survive waiting for a transplant? And therefore, we had put in a mechanical heart in this patient in just May of this year. Why is that important? Mechanical hearts were not pl implanted in, in, in the UAE and very much routinely in this part of the world until we had the, the gift of the infrastructure to allow this to happen over the last 18 months. Now this heart was, uh, mechanical heart was supporting the left side of the heart, it was two sides of the heart, right and left, this was supporting the left side remarkably well until it clotted. So it developed clot that would require a very, very high risk re-implant of mechanical heart or an urgent heart transplant. And therefore it was a miraculous thing that on that night another donor was identified that was the right size, the right blood group and type and the right, the right conditions and the match of the specific antibodies and the genetic makeup to ensure that rejection would not be uh, likely. So everything was identified and delighted to report that the mechanical heart, despite all the scar that was encased in it, it took, it took several hours to dig the old heart out and the mechanical heart out. And then once we we're, once were ready, the team of teams all gathered together, the liver team, the kidney team, the heart team, to stop the heart and the, right and the other organs, to immediately preserve it in, in, in pre a preservation solution that would keep it alive while it was being sewn in, bathe it in ice, and treat it like a young, de newly delivered baby as we carried it to the next room and began the stitch by stitch by stitch effort of sewing it in in the heart. Uh, and, and delighted to report that a mere two hours after stopping the heart, it sprung back into action and the patient's doing remarkably well. So m more news will come as the patient, patient heals, but it's truly another remarkable first given that it's only a handful of centers on the planet that would treat these types of, of mechanical hearts and translate that patient into conversion into a, a true heart transplantation. So truly another remarkable first by the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi team and, and, and a first for the nation uh, of the UAE. Uh, a few, a few uh, things in, in context. Why is this important? Many people thought this couldn't be done. Be, and it can't be done easily because it doesn't rely on one surgeon or one even group of nurses and surgeons or even one surgical team relies, as I mentioned, on a whole infrastructure. At the Cleveland Clinic and Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, the patient is in the center and all of the teams that support are around the outside. Literally everything we do is in the best interest of the patient. So when I was asked as a new CEO whether I thought that transplantation should occur in this way, whether it was a complex heart or liver or living related donors, my only answer was this, the patients need it and we're ready, so here we go. So I'd like, I'd like you to remember that this is not a, much about us as the three remarkable things that I mentioned, the vision of the leaders uh, and the regulators, the partners and the ability to collaborate to make something remarkable happen. As Bashir said, there's a few notable milestones that I'd like to call up for your attention. The first deceased donor lung occurred in February 2018. This is significant because even well-developed countries like Canada and the UK only have one or two lung transplant programs. These again are very, very complicated, multi-specialty collaborative efforts. The UAE's first liver transplant occurred on that same day. And the UAE's first double lung transplant, again, another level of, of complexity occurred uh, this, just this past summer. Let's talk about living related livers. All the transplants we've spoken about are, are complex in their own right, but there's only a few around the world that perform living related liver transplantation. Why is this? 
Living related liver requires someone as healthy as any of you in your, the room to subject yourselves to splitting the liver in half through a long multi-hour operation and then having that piece of liver be transplanted into a dying recipient. So on a, on a great day, that results in two miraculous uh, recoveries, one of a healthy donor and the second of a dying liver failure patient. On a bad day or an unfortunate day, and we know that statistics rule what we do, unfortunately, that can result in two deaths. One death of a healthy person who was generous and philanthropic enough to share the gift of life, half of their liver, with, with someone they may or may not know. Uh, and then a, a, a person who has their life saved because a person cannot live with a failing liver. And that was the, also the case on Friday night. There was literally a patient dying in our intensive care units who wouldn't have survived the night had it not been for identification of that donor. So these are truly remarkable stories. But let me tell you a little bit about how we do this at the Cleveland Clinic. The traditional way of splitting a liver is to use the bigger right-sided portion. There's two lobes, a right and a left lobe. So use a right lobe to take out of the, of the donor and put into the recipient. The great news is that, that big piece of liver will grow and regenerate and support life of the recipient. The bad news or the risk is that puts the donor at risk because they're left with a smaller, often diminutive left lobe. Uh, proud to report that our colleagues at, at the Cleveland Clinic and, and in conjunction with, with other, a few other partners on the planet have developed a unique method of harvesting the left lobe of the liver that safely removes the smaller portion and keeps the donor risk as low as possible while giving a life-saving left lobe to the recipient. And this has been the plan of the, and, and the, the protocol of our living-related transplant team uh, uh, at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, and I see some here in the room, and they can further answer questions uh, for you after, after the, uh, the lecture today. To date, uh, out of nine deceased organ donors and a series of generous uh, uh, living-related donors and other non-related donors, we've saved a total of 27 lives. And the slides need to be updated as we speak because on the table back at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, we are just finishing the week's uh, fifth transplant, is that right? And the week's fourth liver transplant truly remarkable and out of a, a run of luck we're set to do another one just tomorrow remember these operations never before existed in this nation or in this region and in fact prior to this week we had only before done a handful so it's truly remarkable blessing that all of this is occurring on on the week of of, of this meeting and i can share this with you today so in total, uh, before these slides were made, we had performed 13 kidney transplants, seven liver transplants, three lung plant transplants, and two heart transplants. Why is it, are these numbers important? Well, every number on this slide is a life saved, a family impacted, and a community served. And these are all patients who would have left the UAE, staying for months, if not years, in hotels and motels, in cold corners of dark cities around the globe. Now they can stay in sunny Abu Dhabi and have their lives saved and return to a fruitful community existence. What's required? Obviously, clinical experts, an engaged multidisciplinary team we spoke about, a society that has accepted donors, both brain dead and living related, as Dr. Bashir has mentioned. There's now a need for a national donor program. And leaders like Dr. O'Bailey, you can speak with after this lecture, are providing the visionary leadership and the direction to make these things happen, to identify the right donor at the right time for the right patient. And finally, there's after the transplant is done, this is a life of drugs, immunosuppression, and follow-up watching for infections and cancers that a robust multidisciplinary program must guide the patients through for, for, the, for the decades to come. And we're delighted to report that with Dr. O'Bailey and the team on the National Transplant Committee, we're set to do this. So the future is bright. The future is bright for transplantation in the UAE. And in fact, it won't just be in the UAE. 
We're seeking to establish a, a cutting edge, innovative transplant program that will not only serve the people of this great nation, but the region and the world. This is truly becoming very, very quickly one of the spots to acquire a transplant gift of life anywhere on the planet. I'd like to finish with a very human story. Just as I began with human story and I reminded you that transplantation is about human relationships, I'd like to share with you a touching story of how lives were saved between two unrelated people across the globe. Thank you. I'd like to now open up for questions. <laughs> <laughs>